Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Gary Tomlinson, the director of the Whitney Humanities Center, and I want to welcome you today to the first of two Finzi Contini lectures by distinguished Indologist and political activist David Schulman. Before I turn the podium over to the introducer of our speaker, I'd like to say a few preliminary words about the Finzi Contini lectures, each year one of the highlights of Whitney Humanities Center programming. The Finzi Contini lectureship was endowed in 1990 by the Honorable Guido Calabresi, judge of the US Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and former dean of the Yale Law School, and his brother, Dr. Paul Calabresi, in memory, in memory of their mother, Bianca Maria Finzi Contini Calabresi. Guido and his wife, Anne, well, Guido is, 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 could not be with us today, but his wife, Anne Calabresi, is here. And I'd like you to join me in thanking them and their generosity and, and their family for their generosity. Anne tells me that they had a delayed flight back from Italy and only got in at 2 o'clock last night. So, and, and, and Guido is teaching right now, so um, a busy, busy life. Um, Bianca Maria Finzi Contini was a scholar of European literature and a native of Ferrara. Uh, she fled fascism in Italy along with her husband, Dr. Massimo Calabresi, and settled here in New Haven. She earned a PhD in French at Yale with a dissertation on French and Breton historian Ernest Renan. She became professor of French and Italian at Connecticut College and then was for many years professor and chair of the Department of Italian at Albertus Magnus College. She died in 1982 at the age of 80. Past Finzi Contini lecturers have included Amitabh Ghosh, Dino Mengestu, Maxine Hong Kingston, Oran Pamuk, Susan Stewart, and many other distinguished writers and scholars. After the lecture, the lecture today, a, a pragmatic note, there will be a reception in room 108, which is straight down the hall uh, behind you outside the, um, uh, outside the auditorium, and you're all invited to join us there. And tomorrow afternoon, we'll convene again at 5 o'clock to hear the second of Professor Schulman's lectures. And finally, curiously, Yale Legal Counsel instructs me to announce that this lecture will be video recorded. I'm instructed to announce that because apparently People need to know that so that they can be responsible for their, act their actions. And uh, so in any case, now you know you're being video recorded. Be careful how you act. At any rate, um, introducing David Schulman today will be Phyllis Granoff, Lex Hickson Professor of Religious Studies here at Yale. Professor Granoff. So Gary warned me that I better be careful and leave enough time for David's talk, and it's been a challenge. So many are his accomplishments. It's a great honor for me to offer these brief comments about David Shulman, a longtime friend and colleague. And I speak for everyone in the field of Indology when I say <clears throat> that the, his scholarship has been an inspiration to all of us. David is an enormously productive scholar and I don't know of anyone else whose work is so thoroughly animated by the love and empathy that he feels for classical Indian culture. Whether he's translating poetry, writing about theater, singing classical Indian music, plumbing the depths of Indian philosophy, or exploring the history of Tamil language, we know we're in the presence of someone and something exceptional for whom scholarship is joy and in whom the wonder of discovery never lags. In everything he does, his indefatigable energy and never to be satisfied intellectual curiosity are a source of marvel. Some of you may have heard David speak on Monday so that you know he is also deeply committed to social justice and often writes on contemporary issues affecting Israel, the Palestinians, and the world. This in, all of his, in addition to all of his many contributions to Indology. Over the centuries, India has given us many saintly scholars. They led remarkable lives and enriched the world in many different ways. And so it is with David. And as one might expect, in the life of any Indian scholar saint, the wondrous events began at his birth. In David's case, what was so unusual about his birth was the place, Waterloo, Iowa, a city that seems never to have recovered from his leaving it. Its population has been in steady decline since that time. 
home to the John Deere Tractor and Engine Museum, it would seem at first glance to have been an unlikely place for one of the most extraordinary scholars of our generation to have chosen for his birth. But the wonders continue. I do not know if, like the ancient sage Ashtavakra, David recited the Vedas while still in the womb. But I do know that soon after he emerged into this world, his prodigious appetite for learning became apparent. David would go on to master many languages, among them Hebrew, in which he is a celebrated poet, Sanskrit, Arabic, Tamil, Greek, Russian, French, German, Persian, Telugu, and Malayalam, just to name a few. David won a National Merit Scholarship on graduating from high school, and he emigrated to Israel. He entered the Hebrew University, graduating in 1971 with a BA in Islamic history with concomitant focus on Arabic language and literature and African history. He roamed the world, again like a sage of old, and completed his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, this time working on Sanskrit and Tamil. For many years, David taught at the Hebrew University, where he chaired the Institute of Asian and African Studies. He also served as director of the Institute of Advanced Studies and has been a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences for many years. David's many honors include a Guggenheim Fellowship, grants from the National Endowment of the Humanities, and a MacArthur Fellowship. In 2016, he was honored with the Israel Prize, his country's highest cultural award. This puts him in the company of such luminaries as Martin Buber and Zubin Mehta. He has received honorary degrees from the University of Chicago and the University of Hyderabad. Although officially retired, David continues to move the field forward in new directions, mentoring young scholars and pursuing research. In 2017, he was awarded a European Research Council grant on the new ecology of expressive modes in early modern South India. Work in progress includes a book on theater, another book on music, a study of models of mind and existence in medieval South India, and a study of a temple complex in Maharashtra. David's publication career began with his dissertation, Talmud Temple Myths. His first book was published in 1980, and it would be the first of some 30 books that he has written, co-written, or edited. It remains a classic in the field and a book to which I refer my students as something to which they might aspire. Like many Indian sages, David has the power to make his audience hear the words of poets and philosophers in their own language. The poet or sage speaks in Sanskrit or Tamil. We, the audience, hear it in English. This is truly what transpires in his translations of poetry from Sanskrit and uh, South Indian classical languages. Directly, immediately, almost magically, these poems appear to us in our own language as if to defy the very notion of translation as somehow a pale imitation of an original. If we did not know that these are translations, we would never suspect that the voice speaking to us is not the poet's own, such is the vividness, such the immediacy of his translations. Like a sage of old, David loves mysteries. He has written about riddles, about the god Shiva's mysterious game of dice, a book that itself is playful in the best sense, as it moves with a dynamic flow between opposites inside and outside, male and female, delving the very mystery of creation. In his hungry God, he confronts the mystery of a God that demands the ultimate sacrifice of his devotees, the sacrifice of a child. And in his most recent work, More Than Real, he delights in the interplay between real and fiction that, so, that Indian dramatists and poets also so loved. India has given us many wise men. Some were reclusive and withdrew from the fray. Others sought to found a community of like-minded seekers, and David belongs to the second group. Throughout his career, he has created opportunities for students and colleagues to learn together and with him. Over a period of 10 years, he brought students to Kerala each year to study the theatrical tradition of Kudiyatam. Kudiyatam, like many traditional art forms, is under stress with the loss of its patronage. 
If this extraordinary art form survives, it will be to a large extent because of David's efforts in bringing it onto the world stage and into the academic and critical discourse of contemporary theater. David is an extraordinarily generous colleague and teacher. Many of his writings are the results of joint efforts. He loves the give and take, the sharing. And while he shares his knowledge through everything that he writes, he also somehow finds time to work closely with students everywhere, reading their theses, answering their questions on email. His energy is boundless, his accomplishments truly larger than life. I am grateful for his friendship and guidance over all these many years, and so pleased that in his sage-like wanderings, he has come here for this week to share some more of his insights into the mysteries of life and artistic creation. Please join me in welcoming David Shulman. Thank you. Um, I'm a little speechless after that introduction, and I have to say I found it a little hard to recognize myself in what Phyllis was so generously saying, uh, except for the part about Waterloo, which was exactly um, correct. Um, I often say that I was born in a place more exotic than most of the places that I roam around in in the world. and. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm kind of proud to be from Iowa, believe it or not. Um, Phyllis, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody um, who had a part in my being here today. The Whitney Humanities Center, its director Gary Tomlinson, uh, Phyllis herself, uh, Sandra in the office who was fantastic with all of the arrangements and above all, Anne Calabresi for the endowment of this series. It's a great honor for me to be here, and I'm very happy to be here. It's a particular kind of happiness. I have a lot of friends in this room, some long-standing friends and some more recent friends. Um, I'm happy to be speaking to you today. So I'm going to launch right into it because uh, we don't have that much time, and I'm going to be talking about time. Uh, so here goes. Deep in the vast desert to the west, or maybe to the east, lies the mysterious city of the dead, with two towers of fiery copper rising over walls of black stone. No map will take you there. You can only reach it by getting lost on your way to somewhere else, intent upon another mission. But once you are there, it becomes clear that this city was the real goal all along. You may not leave it alive. For that matter, how alive were you when you set out? We don't really know who, if anyone, founded it, but we do know that it bears the footprints and the fingerprints of King Solomon, the wisest and also perhaps the most foolish of men. And it has a name, or rather several names. It's called the City of Copper. Uh, we know it from the Arabian Nights. The great historian Ibn Khaldun identified it as Sijil Masa. So those of you who saw the Mimosa film just you know, an hour ago, um, you were looking at some image of the city of copper. Um, Sijil Masa is a medieval anthropoe at the edge of the Moroccan Sahara. Uh, and though, and um, uh, you could also see, those of you who saw the film, that this now defunct city with its seven metal walls can still carry the weight of a wondrous and fatal journey. I'll be saying a bit more about this film tomorrow. Usually, however, this strange goal for unwary pilgrims is called, following the version of the Arabian Nights, Medina al Nuhas, the city of copper, or more commonly in some of the... the uh, canonical translations of the 19th century is sometimes called the city of brass. Um, there's a kind of sensitive point here, but in my opinion, it is actually about copper. Uh, in Arabic, brass is called al-Nuhasil Asfar, the yellow copper. Uh, and actually, copper itself has a very venerable 
uh, and prestigious genealogy in Arabic, okay, also in the Bible. You may think of the copper ser serpent that Moses made long ago in another desert and it could heal from snake bite anyone who saw it. And that serpent had a name. It was called Nehushtan, coppery. And he survived for centuries in continuous worship by the children of Israel until King Hezekiah, Hezekiah, had it pounded to dust, as we know from the Book of Kings. And the Quran tells us that Allah made a fountain flowing with molten copper for Suleiman, Solomon. But we digress, as happens to all who approach the city of copper, itself by definition a necessary, possibly terminal, detour or digression. We don't know if the city of copper was included in the oldest original version of the Arabian Nights, if indeed there was such a thing as an original version, um, which I have to say I doubt. Um, I'm not going to go into the textual history of this story. Uh, it's very complex, it's also very fascinating. People um, give their entire scholarly lives to exploring the textuality of the Arabian Nights. Um, what I can tell you, um, actually two things. One is that uh, it does exist in the 18th century, late medieval, 18th century recensions, um, what we usually call the Tse'er Er, the Zotenberg Egyptische Recension. These manuscript recensions became the basis of the first printed editions of the Arabian Nights um, in Bulak in Cairo in 1835, and what we now usually call the McNaughton or Calcutta II um, version, 1839 to 1842. Uh, these printed versions came directly out of these late medieval Egyptian recensions so that we know that the story as we know it, and I'm talking about a literary version of a story about the city of copper, that story existed by the 18th century and probably a bit earlier, uh, maybe much earlier. Um, because there's an Armenian version, believe it or not, of the literary text, which apparently goes back to the 10th century. Um, there's a fine essay by James Russell at Harvard about this, if um, anybody wants to read it. I'll come back to that maybe in a little while. Um, we also have a Judeo-Arabic version of this story um, from the Geniza. There's a scholar in Israel, a young scholar called Oded Zinger, who's working on this now. Uh, it's not yet firmly dated, probably something like the 15th or 16th century. And you know there's another Judeo-Arabic version that is Arabic in Hebrew letters. It was uh, printed in Bombay at the, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, this is how it is with the Knights. These things begin to proliferate. Uh, the story exists in other Islamic languages, especially Persian. That's important to me uh, for reasons that you'll see in just a moment. Um, there is a Persian translation by somebody called Muhammad Baki Khurasani, um, prepared for the English resident in Hyderabad, uh, Sir Henry Russell, in 1810. Um, that version may be the source of the Tamil version of this story, um, which is a mid-19th century version. I have to say at least a few words about this at this point, um, because that in a way was my entry ticket into this story. Um, actually, working on the city of Brass, it took me back uh, somewhat nostalgically to the years when I was studying Arabic and Persian at the Hebrew University. I was happy to see that I could still more or less read Persian. Um, and uh, the film that some of you just saw was also an important trigger in what has become kind of an obsession. I'm hoping to write a book about this story um, one of these days, a short book. Um, but the Tamil version has a specificity and a particular interest about it. So let me just tell you, this is in a kind of proleptic manner because I'll only be able to talk about the Tamil version at any length tomorrow. But I would like you to know, even before I tell you the story, which I'm going to do in just a few minutes, even before I tell you the story, this Tamil version was composed by a very famous Muslim Tamil uh, intellectual and author. He's usually called Imam al-Arus, uh, although he's also called Mahan Mappillai Libbay Alim. Uh, he lived on the southeastern coast of the Tamil country um, at a moment of very considerable cultural efflorescence. Uh, his name means son-in-law, 
Arus, um, which seems to be a back translation from the Tamil or Malayalam word Mapillai, which is the caste name for many South Indian Muslims. It's a collective title. But actually, Imam al Arus was indeed a famous son in law who inherited and expanded his father in law's renowned madrasa. He was a successful hardware merchant, and more to the point, he was a prolific author in both Arabic and what is called Arvi. Arvi is Tamil uh, written in Arabic letters. Um, I can tell you from experience that the Tamil alphabet is not suited, sorry, the Arabic alphabet is not suited for writing Tamil. It's something very difficult to learn to read. Um, but uh, this was the script the Tamil Muslims actually usually used until rather modern times. Uh, and this RV version of the city of copper, which is called Tamirapatnam in Tamil, was written, we think, in 1859. It wasn't published until 1900 by his grandnephews, published in Sri Lanka, uh, some two years after the death of Imam al -Arus. And you know what? That initial edition in RV seems to have disappeared completely. I, at this point, know of no surviving copies. But the work was reprinted, in, this time in Tamil script, in 1979 in Sri Lanka, uh, in a sort of slightly modernized Tamil. That fits the textuality of the Arabian Nights. Um, this book, um, this Tamil version of the uh, City of Copper, uh, actually appeared on my desk in Jerusalem one day. That's thanks to the services of Charlie Hallisey, who's here, who Charlie um, set in motion, I think, a kind of worldwide uh, network of scholars and librarians and spies and other such people. And eventually, a single copy of this book turned up in a small library in eastern Sri Lanka at a place called Oluville. And it's to, thanks to Charlie and to the kindness of the librarians there, Muhammad Nuhman and Muhammad Majid Mashrufa in Oluville, that this copy actually arrived on my desk one day. And I think it's an extremely interesting version of the story. You'll hear more about it um, tomorrow. There's another thing I have to say. Um, that is that this Tamil version of the story of the city of copper is very probably the first example we have of modern literary Tamil. Prose. Prose. Uh, there are other kinds of prose in Tamil. Some of them quite old. We have the prose of the commentaries. There's uh, prose of 18th century diaries. There's epistolary prose, uh, some of it recently published by Hermann Tiken. There's the prose of a kind of, um, I don't know what to call it, sort of village narrative mode. It's called Kadai, uh, Kata in Tamil. That exists. But modern literary prose, literary prose, that's always a discovery or something between an invention and a discovery. And it may not be by chance that it is this particular story that was chosen by Imam al Arus for his experiments with literary prose. So, that's important, as I hope to be able to explain uh, tomorrow. By the way, um, you know, I just explained how these Tamil versions have become exceedingly rare, and we found only one copy. Others seem to have vanished entirely. But um, there's an odd um, kind of um, literary karma that attaches to this particular story of the city of copper. Things keep disappearing, vanishing forever. Um, for example, there is, or at least there was, a critical edition of the Arabic text from the Knights um, by somebody called Abu Bakr Shraidi. It was published originally on the website of the University of Aix-en-Provence, um, but that website no longer exists and there seem to be no extant copies of this edition, at least I've not been able to see it. And that's only the first of a long series of such disappearances. I'm not going to go into this at length now. Let me just say that uh, it includes the important treatise on time by a philosopher called, a uh, medieval philosopher called Abu Bakr al-Razi, arguably the most acute intellect in the entire history of medieval Islam. 
he wrote a book about time which disappeared. Um, but, and it's very relevant to this story, as I hope to show you tomorrow, um, we have a few fragments that miraculously survived. They were collected by a scholar by the name of Paul Krauss. That's a name that it's possible, at least, that some people in this room might have heard. Paul Krauss uh, was a great um, genius of Arabic and Islamic studies. Uh, he published a brilliant edition of these surviving fragments of Abu Bakr al-Razi uh, in the early 1940s in Egypt, and in 1944 he committed suicide in Egypt. Um, if I do actually manage to write this little book about this story, I'm going to dedicate it to the memory of Paul Krauss. There's actually something a little spooky about the story altogether, and um, strange things happen. I can tell you if you're interested in it, but let me, um, let me I think, now just try to um, tell you the story, okay? Now, I assume many of you know this story. Uh, it's a very well-known story, one of the most uh, well-known and beloved, also perhaps the spookiest of all the stories of the Arabian Nights. Uh, Borges loved it. Um, it has a kind of long afterlife, you know, after the uh, Arabic versions. Um, even if you know the story, I think it's probably not a bad idea for me to tell it to you in a kind of telescopic version. So this will take about 10 or 15 minutes, I imagine. It could be that just telling you the story might be the most important part of this lecture today. Um, but I do urge you to read it, and I urge you to read it in Arabic because it needs to be read in Arabic. Um, I wanted to get a feel for it. In the course of uh, telling you this story, I'm going to read you a few verses from time to time. Um, you'll see in a minute um, why that's important. So the story is set in the distant past at the time of the Umayyad Caliph Abdul Malik ibn Marwan in Damascus. And he hears one day during the kind of storytelling that happens at the court, he hears that fishermen somewhere have been hauling up in their nets these odd copper bottles or containers, kamakim. And if the fishermen break open one of these bottles, then what happens is that a jinni issues forth, screaming at the top of his voice, et tauba, et tauba ya Rasulullah, forgiveness, repentance, repentance, O oh, messenger of God. I repent of everything that I did. Just don't put me back into that bottle again. Um, and people know that the reason that the genie is in the bottle is because Suleiman, Solomon, actually imprisoned all the genes in these copper bottles and threw them into the ocean. So the Khalifa hears this story and he decides he absolutely must see one of these bottles. You know. So there's a person at his court whose name is Talib ibn Sahl. I don't know if it matters, but Talib actually means something like the seeker, and his father's name, Sahl, means something like simplicity or easiness. Anyway, this Talib, you have to try to remember his name. He becomes important later on. Talib, he says to him, oh yeah, he says, my father was once on a sea voyage uh, to India in the Bulak edition. It says to India. Other editions of the story, say, somewhere near Sicily. He came to an island where these black aboriginal Muslims had fishermen who were constantly fishing up these bottles. So Talib says, all you have to do is send an expedition to, um, to, you know, to where these bottles are. And so the Khalifa, he, uh, he arranges for this. He orders somebody called Amir Musa ibn Nusayr uh, he's the ruler of Upper Egypt. Actually, this Amir Musa, uh, probably a historical figure, is probably the same person as somebody who's usually called Amir Musa ibn Nasr, um, who was a famous astrologer magician in the medieval period. He also had a part in the conquest of the Maghreb. 
So the Khalifa sends a letter to this man, Amir Musa, and tells him to you know, fit out an uh, a caravan and, and to set out in search of the bottles. And there's a guide whose name the Khalifa mentions. So he's, his name is Ab uh, Abdus Samad. Actually, it's Ab Abdus Samad ibn al Qudusi, maybe somehow connected to Al Quds, Jerusalem. Um, this Abdus Samad, he's a wise old man who knows the roots of the desert. Uh, he's so old that he's very reluctant to accept this mission because he knows it's going to be a long journey that may last for years and it, uh, it's going to be an arduous and rigorous journey but eventually he's persuaded and uh, Talib is also coming along and they set off from Upper Egypt north, northwest towards the Libyan desert. They think that they're moving toward the sea. Um, very soon after they begin this journey, the first of many inscriptions turn up. It turns out that the desert, this is an important thing one should know, the desert is actually littered with hundreds or maybe thousands of inscriptions that are buried in the sand or otherwise hidden. Um, in the medieval period, there was somebody called Abu Farah Jalis Bahani who actually collected these inscriptions. Um, the, so the, our story, it's like there's no end of these inscriptions. I think that they're the original core of the story, these poetic texts. You know. So they come upon a kind of castle, an abandoned castle or palace, big black building. Nobody's there, but there are inscriptions there. And the first inscription, um, it's in Greek, supposedly. Um, but fortunately, Abdus Samad, the guide, he knows Greek. So they dust off the sand and he translates it into Arabic. I'm going to read it to you. It's typical of the whole series. So, Kauman Tarahu Bad Masanau Yabki al al Mulki Ladi Nazal Al Kasru Fihi Muntaha Habarin and Sadatin Pilturbi Kajumio Abadahum Mautun O Farakahum Wadaya Ufil Turbi Majamao Keanama Hatturi Halhamu a people, they made things, then wept for the wealth they relinquished. A fortress, inside it, the last word about rich lords meeting in the dust. Death finished them off, tore them asunder. They lost to the dust whatever they had gathered, as if for no more than a moment they'd laid down their loads to take rest, then of a sudden moved on. So once this has been translated, Amir Musa, he hears it from Abdus Samad, and he begins to cry, and he eventually breaks down and faints and passes out. But when he comes to, he then records it in his little notebook, which is probably how we have these inscriptions, right? Um, there's a lot of them in this, this empty palace. I'll read you a bit of the second one where he says, how much pleasure they had, how much had they eaten before it was their turn to be eaten in the dust, and so on. And uh, there are 400 tombs there um, that, no surprise, there's an inscription here, um, probably the builder of the city, he says, in my ignorance I lunged at every promise of safety, and each escaped me. So pay heed to yourself while you are young, before you drink the fatal cup. In no time, soil will be heaped upon you, and you'll be the opposite of alive. There are lots and lots of these messages from the dead. And they always end with that kind of an admonition. Something like, pay heed. Now is the time, unless it's already too late. Learn from me. I had everything. I did everything. I tasted everything. I was strong and rich, and still nothing could hold back the hand of death. Think of yourself. Think of God. You who have come to this place, think hard about what you see here. Think of the accidents of time and the tales that are told. Be not seduced by the world and its finery, its crookedness and lies, its vanities and trifles, for it is a flatterer cunning and treacherous. It gives you a loan only to take it back. It's like the befuddlement of sleep, the dreamer's dream, the mirage of water that the devil produces to lure the thirsty to their death. 
have no faith in this world and no love for it, for it will always betray whoever trusts it, and so on and so on. And this inscription, it's in a kind of rhyming prose, it's called Sajj. Uh, it's signed by somebody called Kush ibn Shaddad ibn Ad. So the father of this man, Kush, Shaddad ibn Ad, he was a famous figure, and he was actually the founder of yet another famous ruined city, a city called Iram of the Pillars, also well known from the Arabian Nights. You know. And this king, he thought his wealth would save him. His own soldiers had to tell him that they could do nothing against the lord of that gate that has no gatekeeper. Sahib al-Bab alavi laysa lahu bawwab. And every time one of these texts is translated, Amir Musa breaks down again, and he copies the inscription. Uh, they wander through the palace. Finally, they come upon a big table. There's an inscription on the table. It says, a thousand one-eyed kings ate upon me, and a thousand kings with two good eyes. All of them now inhabit the grave. And so Abdus Samad and Amir Musa, they take this table, and they move on. Pretty soon, they come to a horseman made of copper. He's holding a spear in his hand. And there's an inscription which says that if they rub his hand, if, if they don't know the way to the city of copper, he will point the way. So they do this, and the horseman kind of whirls around like this and points in a direction quite the opposite of where they were heading, of course. And now, they kind of have to go to the city of copper. I mean, wouldn't you if you got that kind of a message? So they set off, following that direction. Pretty soon they come to a big black stone pillar in which is imprisoned an ifrit. That's a kind of demonic figure, an ifrit. So this ifrit, he's kind of lonely, it seems. He just can't wait to tell somebody his story and to chat about this and that. He reminds me actually of somebody I once met in India years ago. I met this guy um, who had taken a vow of silence and for some 30 or 35 years he'd never uttered a single word. But he was dying to talk to people, talk in the sense that he would write words and sentences in the sand with a stick, you know. He was perhaps the most loquacious person I ever met in my life. So this Ifrit is kind of like that, and he tells his story. It's a kind of long story. In brief, he was a servant of the king of the sea, Malik al-Bahr. And um, this king had a very beautiful daughter, the most beautiful woman in the world. Uh, and he also had an image, an idol, that the king worshipped. And this Ifrit, these Ifrit, they're restless creatures. They roam the world. So one day he found himself in Jerusalem, and he told Suleiman, Solomon, about this beautiful daughter. So, of course, Solomon wanted her immediately, and he sent a message via this Ifrit to the king of the sea, saying, break your idol, take on the true religion, and give me your daughter, and if you don't, I'll come and destroy your kingdom. You know? So, Ifrit um, goes back. He actually enters into the stone idol, and speaking through the stone, he tells the king, the king of the sea, that he should ignore this message. And so the king of the sea goes to war against Suleiman. That's a really bad idea. Suleiman comes with his hosts of predatory birds, you know, and all kinds of other mysterious creatures, and they completely liquidate the kingdom of the sea. And they also destroy the idol, of course, and they take the daughter for Suleiman. And Suleiman, having done that, he knows apparently what the Ifrit has done, so he imprisons him in this stone. Right? He's stuck there in that stone for all eternity or until the day of resurrection, the end of time. And this particular Ifrit, he's also happy to answer questions. For example, they ask him, how far is it to the city of copper? And he says, it's very near. And they say, and where can we find those copper bottles in which the jinn have been imprisoned by Suleiman? And he says, in the sea of El Karkar. You have to remember that name, El Karkar. So maybe the mission can be accomplished after all. And they move on. And indeed, fairly soon, they see in the distance something black with two parallel tall fires. 
Those are the towers made of copper of the city of copper. It has steep walls. When they get there, they circumambulate it, and they, I mean, it's a huge city. It has 25 gates, but none of them can be opened from the outside. These are gates that can only be opened from the inside out. And, of course, they want to go inside, so Amir Musa asks his carpenters to make a big, tall ladder, which they're going to put against the wall. And meanwhile, it takes them a month, the carpenters, and while this is going on, they climb a hill nearby, and they look over into the city. They can see it looks like a very kind of luxurious place, but there is no sound, no sign of life, only the cries of the owls and the ravens. But... Uh, you'll be surprised to hear there are a lot of inscriptions on this hill. Um, and they're in Greek on seven white marble tablets, very much like the earlier ones that you heard. And Amir Musa sheds more tears and copies them down in his notebook. And when he comes down from the mountain, the narrator says the whole world has been painted before his eyes. So Amir Musa is learning to see. And finally, when the ladder is ready, they place it against the wall, and a man from the caravan is sent to climb the wall, and he gets to the top, and he stands there, wonderstruck for a moment, and then they can hear him down below, they can hear him crying out, you are so lovely, and then they see him jump down into the city to his death. So they send another man, and exactly the same thing happens and a third, and a fourth, and so on. Twelve men climb the ladder, and each of them gets to the top, and the same thing happens. They jump down to their deaths. You know. So finally, Abdus Samad, the wise old man, says, I've got to go up that ladder. No, says Amir Musa, we can't let you do that, uh, because if you die, then all of us will die. But he insists. He says, a man who has experience is not like someone who has no experience. So he climbs the ladder, and he gets to the top. He looks down, and he sees beneath him ten incredibly beautiful, ravishing young women, and they're in a kind of big pool. And he also deeply wants to, sorry, to, to jump into, the, into this pool, but somehow he remembers the verses from the Quran of taking refuge in Allah, a'udhu billah, and he holds himself back. Also down below, Amir Musa was really terrified. He shouts up to him, we don't do it, he shouts up to him. We belong to Allah, and to Allah we return. And so, Abdus Samad, he sits down on the wall and he laughs, and he chants these verses, and he describes what he's, what he's seen, and then he begins to walk along the wall, you know, the ramparts of the wall, until he comes to the two copper towers. And beneath the two copper towers, there's a copper horseman again stretching out his hand and there's an inscription which says if they turn a certain pin in the copper horseman's body 12 times the gate will open and that's what he does. And once he's opened that gate he then goes into the city. Uh, he's amazed by what he sees. He comes to another gate and there's a dead sheikh holds the keys to all of the gates so he opens these gates. There's a huge noise. And now anybody can enter the city of copper. And they rush in. Well, actually, not all of them, because Amir Musa is afraid that something might happen. So most of the, or part of the caravan is left behind. But a big group comes into the city, and they, what they see is this very luxurious place. There are palaces. There are marketplaces. Um, they're richly decked in all the wonders of the world. There's bundles of silk and bundles of cotton. Um, there are spices and jewels and pavilions. There are birds made of uh, emerald with um, their feet made of pearls. All of these wonders, but there's no living soul. The people are there, but they're lying on slabs of stone or on silk uh, as if they were sleeping or resting. Their bodies dried up, their bones decayed. And there's a big palace with very intricate passageways plated with gold and adorned with ivory and silk. Um, you know, if you want an image of this, there's a rather beautiful engraving by William Harvey from the, um, sometime around 1829, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can easily find it if you just type in, uh, into Google, if you type in William Harvey, City of Brass, it'll come up. 
uh, gives you a kind of image of uh, what uh, 19th century Orientalist thought this city would have looked like, you know. So uh, there's an inscription in the palace. The inscription says, look well, oh man, at what you see. Take care before you move on. Prepare food for the way, the best you have to suit your taste. For anyone who lives at home will surely depart. Anyone who lives at home will surely depart, and so on. So they wander through this amazing city, and they find a fountain, and at the edge of the fountain there's a bejeweled throne, and on the throne sits a woman more beautiful than any eye has ever seen, with brilliant gems on her forehead, she's covered in pearls, she has a crown of gold, and her eyes look straight at you as if she were alive. Remember Talib ibn Sahil? So Talib is there. He's the guy who set the whole thing in motion. So he is the one who notices that these eyes of this beautiful woman are made of stone and that she's dead. And um, she'll never be able to return a greeting. There are two slaves on either side of the throne. Or maybe they're dolls. Maybe they're dead. It's not clear, one black, one white. Beneath them is one last inscription in this elegant prose. i just read you a little bit of it. In the name of Allah the Eternal, O son of Adam, how ignorant you are of the lifespan of hope, how inattentive to the rapid approach of that final instant. Don't you know that death is yours, that he has already come for you? Be ready to depart. Prepare provisions in this world for the journey, which is about to start. Where is Adam? Where is Noah? Where are the kings of India and Iraq? Where is Shaddad ibn Ad? I am Tadmor, daughter of the Amalekites, who had what no other kings had. Tadmor, but some people here will know this, Tadmor uh, is one of the names for the queen of Sheba, Bilkis. She's buried in the city of Tadmor, according to Ibn al-Athir, one of the famous biographers of the uh, medieval period. I am Tadmor. I ruled happily in vast wealth and pleasure until death came knocking. For seven years there was no rain. When all food was exhausted and there was none to be, brought, to be bought anywhere in our world, we locked the gates of the city and lay down to die, giving ourselves to the judgment of God. Such is the story. Nothing is left for the eye to see but these faint traces. Afar. And at the bottom there's a warning. Whoever enters the city can take what he wants, but no one can touch what is on my body. So Amir Musi writes all this down, but Talib, good old Talib, he says, what does this mean? You know, we're not supposed to touch her body. She's dead. And so he actually tries to strip some of the jewels off of her body. And then one of those mechanical slaves or dead slaves, I don't know, one of them, they have swords, he cuts off his head. And Amir Musa curses him for his foolishness and his greed. And his greed. So they fill their sacks with whatever else they can take, and the caravan now proceeds, and eventually, you know what, they get to the seacoast, and once they're there, they are welcomed by a black Muslim king. Um, they reach the sea at the place that's called Al Karkar, which is where they were supposed to go. And this sea, they, they explain to the king that they're looking for these copper bottles, you know, he says, yeah, they come up all the time. He feeds them fresh fish, actually it's not exactly fish, these are, believe it or not, some kind of mermaids, edible mermaids. <laughs> and he hosts them for several days, they're eating these mermaids, he sends his divers to bring up some of the bottles, they come back with a lot of these bottles, and they take 12 of them, and they also take some of the mermaids with them to go back to Damascus, because Amir Musa, he says the Khalifa, he'll probably find these mermaids much more interesting than these copper bottles in the end. And they go back to Damascus, it takes some time, and when they're there they hand over the bottles and they break one open and the genie comes out and he's screaming, at tauba, at tauba, you know. Um, they, that's all very interesting to the Khalifa, but he likes the mermaids, they've built them these special pools so that they can live and breathe, but, and they're filled with water, of course, these pools, but the mermaids die because it's just too hot. 
And Amir Musa, the leader of the caravan, he's had enough, he's seen enough, maybe more than enough. He begs the Khalifa to relieve him of his duties and to allow him to retire to Jerusalem, Al-Quds al-Sharif, to serve God and to pray. And there he dies. And that's all we know of the city of Kampur. Uh, but what happened to the aged guide, the indispensable and wise Abdus Samad, who I think we would have to say is really some form of the storyteller, Allah knows all. Allah, Allah. Okay, that's the story. Now, I'm gonna take about another 20 minutes, is that okay? Yeah. So I have to say to you that, I mean, I have some thoughts about what this story is all about and what it means and why it is in the form that we have it. Um, I'll maybe give you a little prelude to what I'll be saying tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll offer some possible direction. But before we do that, there's, um, I think it's important that you should know some of the things that people have written about this story and uh, what people have said. And there are also certain factual things that you might like to know. So for example, we might start by asking, um, what is the most useless question we could ask ourselves about this phantasmagoric travelogue? Um, so how about, where is it? Can we find it on Google Maps? Um, but actually, as it happens, this question has a partial answer. Um, not quite clear where the city of copper is, unless it's in Sijil Masa. Um, but al karkar that we actually know. It's a place um, near the old city of Leptis Magna on the Libyan coast. Uh, it's near what's called the Lesser Sirtis, the Gulf of Sidra. Um, and you know, there even the name Kas al karkar has survived. And uh, working backwards, that would mean that our city, the city of Kapar, must be somewhere in the Libyan desert, somewhere off the caravan road that passes through the oasis of Kairawan. That's Undace territory, the English patient. You could add that, if you like, um, to the list of tentative intertexts that go with this story. And I also have to tell you another thing about El Karkar. So, you know, um, there's a village in Israel. Um, it's, a, it's perhaps, I think it's the only Palestinian village in Israel which has retained its original Arabic name. It's called Karkur. Karkur. Uh, it's near Khadera, very close to the coast. And the reason it's called Karkur is that its inhabitants, its original Arab inhabitants, uh, immigrated there from Egypt in the uh, early 19th century when Muhammad Ali ruled over Palestine for um, about 20 years. And these people came from a village that had been also, it also named Karkar in Egypt, but it was named after their original village. They retained this tradition and the original village was on the Libyan coast at Al Karkar. And Al Karkar is now in Israeli Hebrew, Karkur, so sort of twin city of Khadera, uh, by sheer coincidence, but that's what happens when you deal with this kind of story. By sheer coincidence, my wife and I spent a weekend there just a few months ago. Unfortunately, it didn't occur to me to see if I should fish for some of those copper bottles. <laughs> anyway, that's Karkar. Um, you can see that the story belongs to the Maghreb, um, even though there's that tantalizing link to India that the Cairo text, the Bulak text tells us. Uh, but it's a, a Maghrebian nightmare adventure. And it's, by the way, firmly anchored in a wide range of early medieval Arabic sources. Now, we have to make a distinction between the literary version of this story that we know from the Knights and between other references to a copper city somewhere in the desert, maybe built by Solomon or by somebody else, there are many such references. Tabari, al Masoudi, Ibn al Faqih al Hamadani, there are many sources that mention this copper city. And in fact, it's not only in Arabic. I said to you earlier, there's this Armenian version, actually, several versions in Armenian. Um, Middle Persian knows about a city of copper located somewhere north of Iran. It's mentioned in the Bundahishan and in other Sasanian sources. And um, actually, even in Dunhuang, at the very eastern edge of the Silk Road, uh, Uyghur manuscript turned up, which also seems to know about a city of copper situated somewhere to the north 
east, of course, and the Alexander romance um, in its Armenian version knows about such a story. In fact, it looks as if this whole huge area from Libya to India or beyond, and including Central Asia, had some traditions about a lost city of copper that you can't find by any map. Um, among other famous old cities like that. So actually, what we have in the story from the Arabian Nights is some literary uh, reworking of material that was very well known. Um, actually, I think of it as a well-constructed, rather polished literary text, uh, which I'm going to be calling the Vulgate of the Cairo and Damascus coffee houses. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Here's another unhelpful question. What are the layers that went into the composition of this text? That's the kind of question philologists like to ask themselves. And if you like this kind of thing, I can tell you there's a pretty good book about the Knights by a scholar called Mia Gerhardt, and she has offered the following surgical analysis. She says there are three layers. The expedition to El Karkar in search of the copper bottles. Uh, that's first. Second, the episode of the city of copper. Apparently, she says, a secondary accretion. And thirdly, several subsidiary narratives attached to the latter, like the Black Castle, the imprisoned Ifrit, the seven tablets on the mountain, and so on, all connected to the theme, she says, of the transitoriness of life and the omnipotence of death, which I suppose is fair enough. So there is this added link to the Solomon Suleiman material. But unfortunately, that division, it has this effect of obscuring the place of Solomon in the imaginative core of the story. Um, even though in the very oldest sources, he is connected to the city of copper. In fact, I think this has to be wrong. Um, by the way, uh, it must be the case that there is some kind of residue of Solomonic legend taken from Islamic and Jewish sources in this story, like in many of the Arabian Nights. And there's that reference to Tadmur, who is Bilkis, the queen of Sheba, uh, with her riddles. Um, there's actually a lot to say about uh, Solomon. It's, interestingly, the story ends in Solomon's own city in Jerusalem, if, if that were its home base all along. So another less mechanical way to begin to probe the strands that work in our tale is to posit an active Jewish Solomonic focus and minimally a South Asian Indian focus which is deeply engaged with and perhaps mingled into Mediterranean Neoplatonic ideas, as I will try to show. Um, I mentioned Abu al Faraj al Isfahani with this collection, medieval collection of desert graffiti. I want to read one or two of these. So, I mean, you had a sample from the version in the Nights. Um, there's a translation of this book, Kitab Adab al Rabah by Patricia Crone and Shmuel More. I'll just read you two short samples. Um, here's one, it's kind of graffiti, graffito. We have built and we shall perish. What we have built will only survive us for a while. Nothing endures against time except God, whom we do not see but who sees us. Or here's another rather plaintive lament. I am among those who keep an eye on time, hoping for a day of joy without being beguiled by the past. Good luck to the speaker. But the most fascinating aspect of these inscriptions, like the ones in our story, is their seemingly necessary lack of synchronization. In every instance, the burning insight arrives too late. In fact, experience suggests that such insight can never emerge on time. Maybe time or death is always late or out of sync. You know, there's a beautiful poem by Shimborska I'll read you a couple of lines from it. Wonderful poem. It's a poem called On Death Without Exaggeration. She says, there's no life that couldn't be immortal if only for a moment. Death always arrives by that very moment, too late. In vain it tugs at the knob of the invisible door. As far as you've come, can't be undone. But still in our text, these travelers are warned to prepare their provisions, zad for the deathly journey ahead, as if there were some form of tangible, maybe spiritual sustenance and nurture that could carry them across the abyss. Um, 
can it? Let's assume for the moment that the spiritual or mystical angle can clear away the opacity that seems to grow thicker with nearly every sentence as we read on. So Zad, this is the provision for a journey. It can definitely refer to the insight and discipline that a Sufi seeks to cultivate in preparation for another life. And so, is it possible that our story is a kind of allegory? Ta'awil. Ta'awil literally means a firsting, going back to the first source. Some allegory about a mystical journey through the dark night of terror and ignorance toward the light of knowledge and redemption. Um, there's a very fine Arabist, Andras Hamori at Princeton. He wrote a beautiful, captivating essay about this story, um, as beautiful as the story itself, I think. Uh, and he argues like that. He says, the as if living corpses in the city would be mementos of spiritual starvation, the failure to know the true self. And the journey itself is a Gnostic parable, parable of the soul's exile in this world and its yearning to return to the source. So I think it's a little tempting to follow Amori's lead, um, like the way the lost wayfarers follow Abdus Samad, but look what happened to so many of them. And I have a new friend, a young Syrian Arabist who lives in Berlin. His name is Osman Hajar. I reached him by very circuitous and serendipitous ways. Turns out he wrote a master's thesis about the story. It's a very interesting um, thesis. Um, I met him, we talked about it. He also thinks that this story is a kind of Sufi, a Sufi allegory. And he himself is a Sufi, a Sufi practitioner. But I, I suppose I should confess that I don't really believe in allegory, or I don't really like it very much, I guess. I think allegory is almost always disappointing. It tends to flatten and reduce the dangerous expressivity of the original. And I think there must be another less dichotomous or dualistic way to go. And incidentally, there's the end of the story, which seems to me to resist any kind of spiritual reading. What about those human mermaids, edible mermaids, who die at the end in Damascus of the heat? So, in fact, everything about El Karkar, with its black king and his fishermen and the endless supply of gene locked in copper bottles, all of, it, all of this seems to me to tend more toward a kind of surreal parody than to allegory. And the reader could easily ask herself what she feels when the story slips rapidly to its conclusion. Have all the knots been untied, the riddles answered, or do we rise unsettled, unnerved, and still bewildered from our chairs? There are just a couple more things I want to say. Um, First of all, these verses, these haunting verses. Where are they now? They look as if they were formed in the mold of the medieval Latin laments that we know from Spain. Ubi sunt, where are they now? And probably the most moving of these lamentations is that final one in prose spoken, as it were, by the once ravishing Tadmur, the dead queen. queen. In general, this Arabic is relatively transparent Unlike so much of the medieval poetry, a breathless sadness on the edge of death strives to leave at least some sign. Nothing, says Tadmur, the dead queen, is left for the eye to see but these faint traces. And since we are toying for the moment with possible models and precedents, I think we have to call to mind the pre-Islamic and early classical qasidas, the Arabic poems in which the Bedouin lover returns to the dispersed campsite where he first saw his beloved. She's gone forever. Only the eloquent traces, aklal, remain to intensify his nostalgia and to infuse him with despair. In some sense, a positive, healing despair. One of the poets, this is Al-Harith ibn Hiliza, he says, nothing consoles you like despair. Wala yuslika kal yaasi. Once there was love and life and hope, nothing is left, life moves on. So the city of copper is, is in a certain sense an extended nasib, that lugubrious portion of the Lekasida in which this painful encounter with the traces and its emotional consequences are described. But if this link is relevant, as I think it must be, then whatever else our story is about, evanescence, the finality of death, the faith born of desperation, it is also, it seems, about love. In fact, that long episode of the 
imprisoned in the stone pillar turns ultimately on Solomon's frustrated love for this demon's daughter, for the king of the ocean's daughter. And that's a topos that we know from many of the Solomonic legends. And if there is love buried in the city of copper, what kind of love would it be? Because wherever we look in the text, beginning with the copper bottles in the sea, there are stark images of blockage and fatal paralysis. Everyone we meet is trapped in some container with no hope of escape. Death may be no more than the most common and prevalent kind of cage. The freedom to live and want and taste and know lasts but a second, an atomistic moment. And the human body itself, a diluted concoction of dust and water, is no different from the stone pillar or the sealed walls of the city. All of us are stuck until we die when the state of being stuck becomes total. This then is the deep and constant topic of the inscriptions, the low moan of the lament. Crammed into these outer shells, we can't breathe, not in life, not in death. Reading the inscriptions always literally takes away Amir Musa's breath. Death, one might suppose, does this more effectively. But the two states, if that is what they are, are all too alike. As Hamori says, death can look very much like life. And the opposite is also true. Do the living really live? Or are they too akin to the simulacra that turn up at critical moments? Those seductive maidens, for example, who lure men to their deaths when they climb the city walls. In any case, life and death seem to overlap. Although from another perspective, the living are always on the brink of nothingness, a radical intensification of their half-dead a priori state. We should be interested in that brink. And we will see that the Tamil version has something to say about it. If life is a long series of simulations, of simulacra interacting with other simulacra, and of intersecting mostly anachronistic and somewhat ironic messages, what can we say about a work of art? The Copper City is itself a magnum opus, the extraordinary creation of its queen and her architects, as she tells us in the final inscription. Amazement, wonder is a consistent theme in the story, usually linked with terror and the savage scandal of dying. But then the story too, at least in its linear unfolding, must surely also be a stifling sealed box in which we, the readers, are imprisoned, possibly forever. Or we might think of it as a frozen moment, a temporal atom, infinite in scope and meaning, self-limiting, self-mimicking in another sense. What does it take to make this story, or for that matter, any story, any string of words and sounds come alive? It's just here that a strong translation might help. So, in concluding today's lecture, I, I guess it's time for me to come clean and tell you that I think this story, like those inscriptions in the desert, is not so much about dying as it is about living in time, as all of us do. And I think the story probably took shape, I'm talking about the literary text, at a very specific time and place, somewhere in the Islamic East, especially the cities of um, the Iranian cities of Rai and Balkh, maybe a few contemporaneous cities like Baghdad and Basra and Cairo in the 9th to 11th centuries. This was a time when the Islamic free thinkers of the Mu'tazila and the early Kalam were well aware of both the Indian philosophical schools and of the Mediterranean, and especially the Neoplatonic Greek thinkers. And I think that the city of Copper as we know it, arose in that scintillating milieu, and that it is at its earliest core, a lyrical coffeehouse version of the fierce debates about time and substance and conscience, consciousness and God that raged in Khorasan and elsewhere in those centuries. Remember the frame story of the Arabian Nights? Scheherazade tells night after night a story which leaves the king in suspense so that he won't kill her the next day. It's all about somehow playing for time, is it not? So, Here's a story, maybe an in, sort of emblematic story of the nights that seems to take off from that point. Now, um, I think some of you, maybe all of you, hopefully all of you got a copy of a handout that I had prepared as you walked into this room. We're not going to read it together now. Um, I'm going to be talking about these passages that you have there tomorrow. Um, they come from Abu Bakr al-Razi, whom I mentioned earlier. 
and from an Ismaili philosopher, Nasir Khusro. These two had a kind of ongoing debate. They had very fascinating things to say about time. Um, just to give you a slight taste of the way this is going to uh, continue, let me say the following few words and then we'll stop. The city of copper is heavy with time. It's soaked in time, also desiccated through time. Actually, it's soaked with several distinct temporal rhythms or modes which seem to collide and become stuck inside each other, unable to move. It's a place where people lost in time, the time of our everyday experience, come face to face with the locked stuff of eternity that can only open from the inside out. And what happens? Some of them die, some survive, traumatized yet amazed, but that time they have entered for a long moment as a strange and beguiling and perhaps also horrifying nature. It is also strangely self-contained, autonomous, free even from the constraints imposed by God. Can we say more about this startling form of time that is also in some sense timeless, moving at an unfamiliar pace or rhythm? opening from the inside, I think we can. I'll try to do that tomorrow. Thank you for listening to me. Let's just tell them. This, this extraordinary performance, an extraordinary weaving of so many, so many strands and so many threads uh, with, a, with a richness that rivals the story that you're telling us about, it, it really is, it reminds us that, that some of the greatest scholarship is, is, the, is, is, the, is the work of master storytellers. David Shulman clearly is one of those. I can't wait for tomorrow. Uh, we're going to save question and answer for after tomorrow's lecture. Um, I invite you all to, to interact with Professor Shulman at the reception right now, and maybe he, you can ask him some questions personally as, as, as we, as we, uh, as we uh, drink and eat a little bit. So thank you so much for coming. Come back at, uh, again at 5 tomorrow, please, and we'll hear the rest of this fascinating story. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, yeah.